and a very warm welcome to all of you joining us for this policy insight on diversity management and the benefits of intercultural inclusion management discussion and diversity. Um, what are our urban cities up to, um, both uh, in uh, the Euromed and but across more widely, is the subject of our conversation this, this morning for one hour. We have a, a sterling panel of contributors and uh, we have uh, audi an audience that's both on our Zoom, but also live stream. Before I say, before I bring in our speakers, let me say a little word, a, a few words about the modes of engagement. Those of you who are on Zoom, it will be really helpful if you have your camera on. Make sure you're on mute, and ensure that if you wish to raise a question or raise a query, then please use your virtual hand. Your virtual hand you'll find by the icon of participants, in case you don't know, and use it there to raise your hand. And then we'll try and bring you as many of you in to have this uh, very timely conversation. I also want to welcome our Zoom, uh, our live stream audience. You are also included in this, in this, in this discussion, obviously. A very warm welcome to you. Um, those of you who on live stream who wish to raise a question, don't hesitate to um, push your, put your uh, questions online through hashtag FOE debate uh, and we will take your questions also um, and that's it that's in terms of the kind of modes of engagement and I just urge you all of you that I know it's early in the morning perhaps it's a bit later elsewhere because we have an audience from Europe but also the North, uh, North Africa and Middle East so we're covering a big region uh, a, a big regional factor here so I'm w welcoming all of you to participate uh, as much as you can and not to be bystanders and passive. Uh, it'll be helpful uh, because actually this debate is really at the core of how societies at a local level work and how do we make sure that societies can work better in the context we find ourselves in. And the, city, the issue of urbanisation and uh, um, diversity management in cities is long-standing. Perhaps I think more recently in the past 30 years, the issue has got the attention of policymakers more so. And what we do know is at least um, in, in both actually in the Euromed area, but also Europe and the world more widely, urbanization um, um, has, has a history and a relationship with the wider issues around instability in the world, the patterns of migration and refugees in any city you go to in the, in the world, you'll know there will be uh, a very different mix that reflects what's happened in history and in the world. And you'll see that actually most of our cities are very, very clearly delineated between those who've come in the past 100 years or 80 years or 60 years, 50 years um, of a certain colour, certain culture, certain religion. And they will be, sa they will be mostly occupied in poor accommodation, um, with very poor infrastructure and will be placed in a situation where fending for yourselves is the order of the day. And then zoom forward to now and suddenly we're having questions about why isn't diversity working? And we have to ask ourselves, um, who's responsible for that? And ha but actually, blame is not the order of the game here. It's about solutions and how we move forward. Because there's a lot we can do, what we've learned uh, to be able to do um, over time. So I'm going to uh, start with one of our first panelists. And we've got an um, all-woman uh, all panel, which I'm really pleased to note. Um, and that's not, not just a kind of a face statement. I mean it, because we know from neuroscience, women make better decisions and are better at negotiation and discussion. I, I want to bring in Katarina from Eurocities. Katrina, you've been um, um, involved in, um, as I understand it, surveying cities most recently. And so what policies and best practices from your, from your survey and your experience would you say lead to social cohesion within the Euromed cities? Over to you, Katarina. Thank you very much, Damendra. Um, also, big thank you to Friends of Europe uh, for inviting me to this debate. Um, and indeed, I would say that the key to your question is structural, inclusive and sustainable integration policies mm -hmm. uh, that work towards equal opportunities for all inhabitants in the city. Now, for those of you that don't know us, uh, Eurocities is the network of 190 big cities in 39 countries. And a lot of the work that we are doing with our members on the integration of migrants is done in the context of our mutual learning program, where cities come together and learn from each other's good practices. Another way through which we gather information on integration measures on the ground is our Integrating Cities Charter, 
and by signing the charter, cities commit to providing equal opportunities for the residents. And at EuroCities, we monitor this progress, as you have said, um, and actually have done so over the summer now. Um, and I'm happy to, to share with you today some mm -hmm. insights for this upcoming report um, about how cities foster social cohesion. And of course, there are different local contexts and cities all over Europe, um, but there are several overarching trends that arise out of cities' best practices. And I want to mention just four of them now. So first, cities are developing integration policies in a more structured and sustainable way. Following the increase in the arrivals of migrants and refugees in Europe in 2015 and 2016, and the first reception and integration efforts, cities have made key changes in their administrative structures, and they have expanded the scope of their integration strategies. Cities have also taken on increasing responsibility, sometimes also through changes in the national law, for the integration of newcomers. And they have established more systemic guidelines, plans, and models for integration. Now, very often, these also relate to a distinct city identity as an inclusive way of making newly arrived migrants part of the city's citizenry, which is then also written down in the respective integration strategies. Being able to see yourself as Amsterdamer, Milanese, Marmobor, or Utrechter already goes a very long way in creating a shared identity and setting the context for social cohesion. Second, cities mainstream integration across different policy areas as a way to respond to migrants' needs more holistically. What does that mean in practice? It means increased cooperation between different city departments, bringing together integration services, education, employment, social welfare, health, culture, and so on. And more and more, this is done by way of one-stop shops where all services are brought together under one roof to facilitate the integration process. But cooperation also happens beyond the city administration and includes local stakeholders, such as civil society organizations, local employers, migrants associations, and so on. So mainstreaming integration in such a way, again, comes back to creating a holistic approach um, and is absolutely needed within the bigger picture of social cohesion. So having that comprehensive viewpoint of integration is important, but it also needs to go hand in hand with focusing on the specific integration needs of particular groups, which is my third point. Now, this applies especially to migrants that may be particularly vulnerable. And most cities have dedicated services for migrant children and youth, um, specifically also unaccompanied minors, migrant women, migrants with uh, specific health needs, um, and also undocumented migrants. Now, this is done by way of tailor-made integration services, but also by an outspoken commitment to non-discrimination and anti-racism. And many cities have put in place plans and strategies to that end um, that are often based on an intersectional understanding of migrants' experiences of discrimination. A lot of cities also have dedicated offices for non-discrimination, for instance, in Barcelona. And these structural contact points are important elements within the broader aims of fostering social cohesion. Now, together with creating these structures, cities are aware of the need to openly and publicly communicate about inclusiveness and equal opportunities, which is my fourth and final point for now. This shows uh, the city's openness towards all their residents, and it also contributes to creating a climate for living together um, and foster social cohesion again. Now, there are many good examples of cities putting this into practice, uh, from dedicated communication campaigns to involving their mayors in championing the schools, uh, to engaging the public through intercultural events. And, and one good, good example here would also be Nicosia and Cyprus, um, but also to promoting social cohesion through specific radio shows or social media activities in very innovative ways. Um, and here it's also very important, again, to take into account the role of culture and bringing uh, people together. Now, of course, there are other transversal trends that we found in serving our member cities, uh, such as including migrants in developing integration strategies or making city administrations themselves more diverse as well. Um, but I think I'll leave it here for now. Um, we will publish the whole report on the 2nd and 3rd of December at our Integrating Cities Conference. And you're all very welcome to join us then as well. Thank uh, you. Now, looking forward to the debate. Catherine, thank you very much for that. That was very kind of uh, very structured um, uh, and very clear. I suppose one of the questions that was raised in my mind, this is not for necessarily for you to answer at this stage, but those of you in the Zoom audience live, live stream, please think about this. Um, what you say, said 
or stated are the kind of structures and features, but it would be good to know what the impact is. How are people feeling about this on the ground? Is it working? Because if you think about the kind of narrative that the COVID crisis has created in terms of the impact on those who are uh, on the sharp edge of inequality, it's only, um, I suppose, reinforced inequalities. And we know that um, systemic discrimination has only become much more forceful and when you look at what's happened to black, black and ethnic minorities across Europe and the globe, but especially women uh, uh, as well. And it would be good to know whether these structural features you're, that you've referred to um, are actually going to have an impact on the ground. And are they bottom up or are they top down? But something to think about, and we'll come back to that in that debate. I want to move on to the Council of Europe. We have Irene. Irene, welcome. Irene. Sorry, um, uh, yes, I have to unmute. Hello, everybody. Hello. A warm welcome to you. Um, many. Hello, Irene. Hello. Just a bit of technical. We do. We just have, we had a technical hitch. Yes. Don't worry, it's on our side, but it's fine. Um, we um, you just heard what we we, we you know from Euro uh, from uh, Eurocities, and my point about impact. Many people have uh, um, felt that migration policies have actually been a failure up to this point uh, in the past few decades, if not longer. Um, from from what your what. what from your perspective, what does intercultural integration bring to the table of migration policies? And in that context, what are the tools you can uh, make use of to improve trust? Because trust is one of the key issues um, in the de debate about diversity management integration, but it's also about the sense of um, lack of confidence in each other and cultural difference, religious difference also plays into that. But over to you, Irene. Yes, as you said, the, the mantra in your introduction, the current challenges we're experiencing in relation to diversity and sense of belonging and trust are to a large extent due to past policy mistakes. Of course, we, we should be careful when we speak about mistakes because every public policy progresses as an iterative process, as a constant chain of errors, uh, learning improvements, or sometimes slide backs. And this is in an endlessly changing context. So what I see as the biggest original sin mm -hmm. of past integration policies is that they have focused to a large extent, whether by design or by default, on framing conditions for access to access to things like status in terms of residency or citizenship, access to rights and services. And while on the surface, integration was presented as a two way process. Uh, you remember, for instance, the Europe, uh, European Union common uh, principles on integration and many, many other policy framework, they lip service to say that integration is a two-way street. But in practice, the onus has actually been always on migrants. And Indeed. there has hardly been any conscious effort to engage the host society as an active part of the process. In other words, I think the socio-psychological and identity factors Community relations, community cohesion, perceptions, attitudes, relationships, they were neglected. And yet, these are really widely responsible for making integration inclusive. Mm. Um, and this is the gap that the intercultural integration approach actually uh, filled. And I'm delighted that you have chosen to focus this event on that term, which is not yet very much used, as far as I'm aware. Uh, it's a strict as a structured process of developing that policy framework. Um, we started doing it in the Council of Europe in 2008 with the Intercultural Cities program. And based on the, the results of that program, uh, emerged a comprehensive and deeply operationalized policy concept with a set of indicators to measure pro progress. And it's now embraced by over 140 cities globally. A pan-European standard was adopted by the Council of Europe's 47 member states in 2015 on intercultural integration. So it became really a quite, um, concept, quite well conceptualized approach. And now we are actually working, and that's maybe a news for many of you, we are working on adapting the standard to the national level. 
So we are really trying to bring the intercultural inclusion, intercultural integration policy framework to the national level in a multi-level governance uh, approach. Now you're asking what are the keys, what are the tools? Now at the heart of the intercultural integration concept is the need to create condition within the whole society to accept migration as a normal and largely beneficial phenomenon. There is a need for societies to understand the potential value of diversity that is, uh, comes with cross-border migration, and even sometimes internal migration, actually. And the need for inclusion as a moral, political, and economic imperative. Above all, intercultural integration focuses on um, creating possibilities on, in, for incentives, for meaningful interactions in all areas of life. Now, interaction is really the core mm. of uh, intercultural inclusion. It happens in education and enterprises, in public space, in arts and culture, in the neighborhoods, and it is the means of building trust and sense of belonging. I in fact, the it's not something that we have invented, it's based on the contact theory in sociology, which granted is not necessarily accepted by everybody, but no. it's quite a strongly supported theory. Yes? I was I was agreeing with you. It's not a strongly supported theory. Please do continue. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm not going to be very long. Mm -hmm. um, so often, often intercultural, all, often the, the task of building trust and relationships it is entrusted to grassroots organizations, and of course they have an extremely valuable role. Um, but unless this is embedded in policies, mm -hmm. in urban planning, in the way we deal with schools and neighborhood segregation in the way we encourage diverse and inclusive decision-making bodies, uh, mm -hmm. inclusive bureaucracy, inclusive arts, inclusive sports, the effects of grassroots efforts will not be either far-reachable or sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the, okay. the integration policy model asks public authorities to really take their responsibilities and focus on three things, equality and non-discrimination, that's mm -hmm. obviously key, and there's many ways of doing that by by making sure that the uh, public administration is equitable, uh, inclusive, and diverse, to embedding, uh, you know, in uh, doing diversity and inclusion audits, and, and many, many other things. I have no time to go into detail. Sure. Second pillar, embracing diversity as an asset and learning to manage it competently. And this is through public discourse, through uh, training and capacity building for um, intercultural co uh, competence of all officials and all public service uh, professionals, educationists, professionals, etc. And finally, fostering meaningful contact and interaction. And taken together, these three dimensions contribute to equality, to equity mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. inclusion and cohesion. And the target of intercultural integration is society as a whole. Mm -hmm. And the message is that the migration and diversity, if managed in a competent way, and constructive way are a win-win. Um, I'm finishing with last phrase. Several studies have shown, uh, notably studies correlating uh, your barometer, the quality of life in European cities, and the Intercultural Cities Index, which is our benchmark. Um, they have established, so these studies have established that cities which perform better according to the Intercultural Cities in, in Index, in them, citizens are more satisfied with the availability of jobs, the quality of services, the public administration, and with community cohesion. Mm -hmm. So we have some quite serious evidence that intercultural inclusion works. You were asking about um, evaluation impact. Yeah. So intercultural integration is a key element of good governance in the end of the day. It's no longer a luxury or something that you want to experiment with. Um, I think we have quite strong evidence that it's something that should be embraced by everyone. You're in it, absolutely. Thank you. And but you, you, you know, um, you can imagine the language we're, we're, we're speaking in. Uh, if we had the populists in the room, can you see what fun they'd make of it? Uh, and actually think, my God, what are these people talking about when we've got issues around jobs, people are taking our jobs, we've got such paucity of resources, and you're talking about intercultural communication. Uh, and there's something about the language, but I, I agree with you. It's a step forward from what we've had before in terms of integration, which has always been a, a loaded term. 
uh, historically where the, the incomer has to somehow divest themselves of any of their identity to in integrate into some sort of norm. And, you know, the intercultural aspect obviously brings th things together in a different way. What of schools? Um, if, you know, from my experience in the UK, um, and I'm not that, that conversant with, you know, continental Europe and the Euro and the Euromed area, but schools can be the drivers and the anchors for that intercultural engagement if we do it right. But if you have populations of communities that re are placed in certain housing where you have the poorest goals or overrepresented by minorities, I'm not sure how it works. But over to you, uh, what's the role of schools and how do we improve the role of schools to be the driver, the kind of anchor for this agenda? But thank you for asking this question because it makes us uh, looking really into concrete things. Because as you're right, speaking at a very high level, it can sound very fluffy, um, very lofty, yeah. and very wishy-washy. So in fact, uh, intercultural integration is something that, that touches upon really all the functioning systems in the cities. And schools are not a panacea, of course. They're often expected to do everything, but they can do quite a lot. Um, so along with police, faith organizations, neighborhood organizations, neighborhood groups, and, and everybody else, the schools have a role to play in terms of mixing um, and, is, and working towards desegregation. Of course, that's easier said than done, mm. because as you know, segregation is, and you mentioned it in the beginning, segregation is the biggest reason why people distrust each other, uh, they don't know each other, and it's easier for people who live separate lives to attack each other and hate each other and not to live in solidarity. So desegregation, physical and mental, is key. So first of all, you need to prevent school segregation. It's difficult because uh, schools are attached to neighborhoods. And when neighborhoods are segregated and, and children go in their neighborhood schools, obviously that's what happens. Or otherwise, there's often white flight. People leave yeah. schools where they're more of children of color or migrant children. And this is happening everywhere and there are no magic solutions. No. But there are experiences, and I can give a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. One option that seems to really work well is to um, uh, make poor and ethnically mixed neighborhood schools excellent and attractive. One example, a showcase example, is a campus Ruthley in Berlin, Neukölln. I don't know, maybe Katarina heard about it i think you're german i think it's been quite of a, a showcase really and i don't have time to tell the story but it's an example of how you can turn things around mm -hmm. and make failing schools some of the best schools and that work both for minorities and majorities um, alike and mm -hmm. they become vector of inclusion and, and belonging secondly bringing schools of different confessions under one roof as for instance has been done in tilburg in the netherlands that's not magic either, because even one, under one roof, and I think Bosnia and Herzegovina has t taught us a lesson that could still be segregation under one roof. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, there are many things to do in the schoolyard or in the classrooms or in the teachers' rooms to make sure that the, mess, that the communication goes and that there is some kind of empathy and working together. School twinnings have been tried, for instance, in Stockholm with neighborhood schools and poor neighborhoods and central Stockholm schools working together over a year to make kids develop uh, empathy and an intercultural understanding. Making parents full partners in the educational process through all kinds of things, inviting them via postcard rather than a letter to make it less intimidating, to offering gym classes for parents as in one school in Swansea, which means that they cross that barrier that is scary, you know, going into the school building and talking to the teachers. As you see, it's really often at the level of, of psychology and taking the person, mm -hmm. making school intercultural spaces by having diverse teaching staff. That's really, really important because you need to give example and motivate students by role models or offering deal, deeply multicultural environments and curriculum as in the European school in Vienna, which um, teaches this in its primary curricula, 20 languages to each pupil, mm -hmm. making linguistic 
uh, knowledge uh, and competence really the basis of interculturalism? I can go on, but I think we can. No, no, here thank so you. No, that's very specific. And, you know, what occurs to uh, myself, and I'm sure many others, is that some of these things are just so simple, aren't they? They're about, you know, the basic sociology and psychology about how humans and communities get on and uh, yet we fail uh, we fail the trick or the test each time because uh, of politics or discrimination or prejudice unfortunately uh, and the sense of what a norm is uh, in in many societies i want to open it up to our, our audience i'd like to get your reaction to what you've heard you might have your own experience you may wish to share your particular view on actually how things should work or actually your experience of how things haven't worked also and what we need to do to improve but what we do know is that in the current circumstances that we find ourselves where you've got the double whammy of a health crisis and an economic crisis we know who's going to suffer the most and we know where they're going to suffer the most in ma many of our uh, uh, urban centres. I want to open up, I think we have one already. We have uh, Leia, Leia Ashampong. Leia, your video is off. Hi, uh, yes, I'm not able to switch on my um, video at this moment. I hope that's OK. That's OK. Um, just introduce yourself you. and your uh, question. Yes, this is me just um, uh, in a personal capacity, uh -huh. but I did um, want to come in on some of the points. I very much was interested in hearing what you had to say, Elena, and um, I agree with what you said as well, um, Amendra, that some of these things are very um, simple points around um, interactions and human interactions. Um, and coming back to what you said, Elena, I agree that there is um, often uh, little effort or sometimes it's just difficult to engage the, the host societies as you phrased it um, and I think you can see this very clearly when it comes to landlords and estate agents that choose to discriminate against third or fourth generation Europeans that have non-European names mm. Um, mm. and that's just uh, that that's one example you also see it in terms of um, trying to get jobs um, but also in terms of um, wanting to um, be engaged in uh, uh, civil society um, uh, opportunities, for instance, getting onto the local um, uh, uh, the local park board or something like this. Um, and so I'd be interested in understanding how how to remove the barriers to engaging host societies in the integration process. I think you 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 touched upon it when you were talking about schools, but as you say, schools are not panaceas for for all of this work. So what sort of other options are there towards um, uh, engaging host societies into this uh, uh, integration process? Uh, Leia, uh, Leia, 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 yeah. Um, if you can hear me um, clearly there, I, I think we had a bit of a sound issue there. Um, what, what's Sorry. your, no, it's on my, on my side, what's your view? What, what do you think are some of the things we should, because this is not a, we like to make sure that this is a, you know, a, an engagement of all of you. We're not, it's not just a classic conference where you listen and ask post questions to the speaker. It's about all of us joining in and contributing to this debate. What's, what's your sense? Um, so I'm I'm British, if you can tell from my accent. Indeed. Um, and uh, and um, uh, as as everyone knows, uh, we're currently going through a Brexit situation. And when that took place, um, I very much felt like I um, I didn't understand my country. So I'm yeah. I'm ethnically from West Africa, but I'm yeah. a third generation British person. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is my country, which I love. And so Brexit wasn't a very it was a not a great time for me being here, but one of the things that helped in terms of understanding the different perspectives and views of people who chose to vote for Brexit um, was organizing things like street parties. So having that level of engagement on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis really helped. And it helped me to understand what the concerns of people were who voted for for um, Brexit, and they had very similar concerns that I had at a political level, but they were choosing to take it out on the European elections, um, sometimes because of the fact that they didn't have all of the information to, to fully engage. Sure. But I think that, that is one key point, is just simply organising these sorts of um, uh, street parties events where, where you really get to speak to people. Another thing is that as a result, we ended up having things like um, 
monthly knitting circles and that was people of all ages and I found that helpful because for a lot of people in society what the elders in their in their um, families and communities say resonates and has an impact on them so if you're able to um, draw get older people in society to be a part of this integration process mm -hmm. that then filters down to um, the, the younger people within a family structure and it helps to ensure that moving forward there's this sort of recognition sure. mm -hmm. integration is something that is it's a no-brainer essentially it's, exactly. it's something that, that that makes sense it yes. comes back to this idea of of human interaction sure and um, so wow. i'd say that for for my community those were the two things that really helped because post brexit i was I I I was witness to seeing the amount of hate that there there was yeah. in the street. People felt very much emboldened to just shout things at me, to shout things at my family, mm -hmm. and I even had yogurt and uh, oranges thrown at me post oh. as well. So yeah, um, yeah. awful. I know. They I've heard the stories. Them. Yes, I, I also I come from the UK myself and grew up there, and I know what you mean. And it's amazing, isn't it? And I don't think it's just to the, in the UK. The public narrative of who belongs and who does not is so enduring. You can be fourth generation, and you'll walk somewhere, walk into the situation, and someone will say, "So where are you from?" A proxy for you must not be from this country. And in the, uh, that unconscious bias, that unconscious bias is so deeply ingrained and we need to find ways in which actually future generations um, can have that sense of um, ease of presence on the streets uh, and in their countries that they feel completely uh, at one uh, rather than having to, even if they've had like, you know, grandfathers that came in the 1910 or 1920, still being posed the question about, do you belong? Um, I want to ask others to contribute. I'd like to hear from our, you know, uh, we, this is a, 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 a policy insight in partnership with the Allen Foundation, so we're very grateful to be working with them. I want to hear from those of you on the other shore. Uh, we have many people joining us from all over uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Those of you um, are from there, please join. Give us your experience because it's a different, pretend, you know, a very different narrative. Um, but I do want to bring in uh, Mohammed. Mohammed, are you there? Mohammed Sadi? Are you there? Ah, okay. No, I think we've we've lost him. Um, but if there are any, if there are any anyone, if there's anyone else who'd like to. I can see some faces who are looking kind of like, shall I, shall I not? Don't hesitate. Please don't be shy. Um, so if there are no takers at the moment, I'll move on to our next uh, contributor. And our next contributor um, is Eleonora, uh, who is Head of Operations and Intercultural Research at the Anna Lynn Foundation. Welcome, Eleonora. Can Thank you, you Commander. Can you hear me? So... What, yes. you know, what in terms of focal points of socialization between uh, ac and across Euromed region, what differences in, in integration do you see between Euro, uh, European countries and MENA region? Okay, first of all, uh, well, I would like to give a very good morning uh, to, to everybody that, uh, that is participating in this uh, big conversation. And I think that uh, an activity and uh, a big conversation like the one of uh, today uh, testify of our commitment uh, from international organizations to uh, young uh, women and men, to uh, civil society representatives and uh, think tanks to the promotion of, of dialogue. Today, in the midst of um, the pandemic, uh, speaking of intercultural dialogue, that is also the mandate of the Annalyn Foundation, it might look like a luxury. But uh, from our perspective, uh, this is not a luxury. And actually, it is a need that has been expressed uh, by uh, all the civil society representatives that we have uh, consulted and the large number of uh, people that live in the societies of, of the region. And we have the evidence uh, uh, through our uh, research, scientific, uh, scientific research. So speaking of intercultural dialogue today um, is understood as uh, speaking of a part of the solution for some of the pressing issues for our society. So uh, intercultural dialogue is considered a tool for uh, sustainable growth, uh, a tool to uh, also improve uh, social cohesion, to give uh, more opportunities also for job creation and uh, 
youth development and exchange for the empowerment of civil society. I, I think it is important that we state this at the very beginning because otherwise it seems as if we are speaking of a realm that it is far from the, the needs uh, and uh, the basic needs of, of people. Actually, we are think, speaking today of something that it is important and can make a difference to, to the lives of, of people all around the Mediterranean. To answer your question, the matter of the differences in north and south of the Mediterranean about the tools for, for integration and the points of socialization, I would like to, to share with you some data from our uh, scientific uh, research mm -hmm. uh, that aims to map trends in intercultural relations and also our experience uh, of working with the largest uh, network of civil society organizations. Indeed, yes. So I will yeah. Yes, uh, we are uh, we are lucky to have, uh, let's say, this big network of uh, organizations and people committed to, to this agenda, because we need to be many and all uh, working together. So I will just uh, share data from on five different uh, questions areas. Uh, we spoke about uh, uh, diversity. What, uh, when we ask people about their appreciation of cultural diversity, we see that uh, North and South, with a discrepancy of one point percentage, we see that people consider cultural uh, diversity as a source of prosperity for, for their society. So over 70% of respondents, <clears throat> they consider diversity as an asset for also economic uh, prosperity. And then we have 90% of Europeans and 80% of Southern and Eastern Mediterranean that are calling for equal rights and opportunities for people from different cultural and uh, religious backgrounds. So we have here a social basis, so let's say also for the promotion of the policies that we are uh, talking about that Irena and also Katerina uh, mentioned. Uh, on the other hand, when we ask people what can be effective tools also to live better in multicultural societies, as number one priority emerges education. Also, you tackle this issue with, uh, with Irena, and the schools are seen as the first socialization point by over 80% of people north and south of the Mediterranean. Then we the uh, striking importance also given uh, to the organization of uh, uh, multicultural events, uh, artistic events, as also uh, the speaker that from the audience that took, uh, took the floor, this can be a starting point to facilitate interaction between the different groups. Um, also by events that can be uh, pleasant. And then this is an important starting point to, uh, to allow direct interaction among people. And finally, we see that the 77% of Europeans and 81% of Southern and Eastern Mediterranean consider that it is very important to allow the expression of cultural diversity in the public space. So cultural diversity, religious diversity shouldn't just uh, pertain the, the private uh, sphere, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be limited uh, in the public space. And then also to answer your question about the main methods of interaction that we have registered. Um, we see that uh, Europeans mainly interact within the neighborhood and uh, the public space and uh, through, through work, while uh, Southern and Eastern Mediterranean, uh, mainly through the internet. And if I can share now, if I can anticipate also the data from our latest uh, survey that we carried out uh, in this year, so in the midst of the, of the pandemic, uh, still the internet is uh, gaining a much more important, especially in the southern and eastern Mediterranean, and despite the limitations to, to mobility among Europeans uh, that we all uh, knew, the neighborhood is still uh, seen as the main space for social interaction. Uh, finally, dialogue and dialogue measures uh, are seen as very effective tools uh, also for the prevention of cultural divides and conflicts and the radicalization in society. Uh, among these dialogue measures, um, we see that education programs uh, youth-led initiatives and then the youth participation in public life are seen as the tools to facilitate uh, and to prevent actually potential radicalization and the conflict uh, within society. So I just wanted to give sure. you this a brief overview of differences in north and south, but also this common basis that we have when we speak about intercultural policies that it, it is actually uh, from the voice of the people. So we are. 
talking to citizens at large from the Euromed, the Euromed region. No, it's good to have that reinforced because actually when you think about many of our cities but in the Euromed area, you know that diversity is both its economic driver, but it's also its cultural uh, driver. Uh, and it's, it's a, these cities are much more attractive. Uh, people enjoy those spaces more. And we know that, it's ever thus. And also that point about interaction. Um, we know that you know, the internet has become the new public space for interaction in different ways for, for good and bad. And it's only gonna be increased in terms of what we find ourselves in, in terms of the health and economic crisis, that the, 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 the web, <coughs> the internet, um, and digitalization are now going to be the new norms of interaction, consuming, and, and a whole range of other things, and keeping in touch with family even. So we know that those are here to stay for the moment. But um, if I may, if you can be brief in your response, because I want to bring in um, some of our uh, uh, audience who have now uh, prepared to engage in, in questions. What about the role of cities from your perspective? Because we've heard earlier from EuroCities and we've heard from Irena about the fact that this is not simply about events, this is about systemic intercultural um, operations where it's about who's in politics, who's employed, um, the kind of structures that are put in place. What's the role of cities, and, and I suppose, what's the role of cities and, and yourselves as a foundation in moving this agenda forward? Well, uh, we heard what are the main uh, tools for socialization. So uh, the public space is a <coughs> central space for this socialization. And uh, municipalities, uh, they have a role uh, that they can play to support artists, civil society, uh, educators uh, <coughs> in the formal and informal sector. But uh, again, as it was said, it is important to make this approach systemic. So it is important to, uh, to embed policies and funding mechanisms that can uh, take the individual initiatives to a uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable policy and sustainable um, approach for for integration uh, and for for permanent dialogue so uh, so cities can facilitate the creation of these mechanisms uh, to bring around the table different uh, different actors that are all committed uh, to this to the promotion of this agenda and that and can uh, give them the tools to, to implement, let's say, these, uh, these, these actions. And on the other hand, they can make the public space a space for uh, structured intercultural interaction. So when we were speaking about uh, these uh, public uh, intercultural or uh, multicultural uh, events, uh, this uh, should become, let's say, a priority also in the okay. agenda of uh, local authorities. And then uh, just uh, going to foundations uh, such as ours, uh, like international organization, I think we need to work at uh, four different levels. One, it is about advocacy and research. So to continue uh, working at the nas international, national and local level uh, to push for, uh, for this agenda and to give evidence, uh, scientific evidence uh, on the importance uh, and the benefits from uh, from the promotion of this agenda, we needed to work for uh, skills development and the uh, capacity building uh, in, in for intercultural learning and citizenship. So we work for uh, with the multipliers, multipliers that then again needed to be supported for the continuation and multiplication of their efforts. We need to work with the civil society and for this uh, uh, we make available resources, uh, different uh, funding schemes uh, that uh, can help a civil society also to work with the schools, for example, to work with municipalities and for the organization of, of all these uh, activities at the, at the local level. And finally, we need to support uh, young people for international exchange, but also for participation within their, their societies. So I think uh, these are the ingredients okay. that we try to make uh, this um, and sustain. Indeed, and I suppose what keeps on, thank you a lot, but one thing that keeps on occurring to me, and I, I'd be interested in what happens to your conference later, Katarina, uh, uh, in terms of integration and the, the agenda, but that thing about what works, what do we understand to have worked uh, from a citizen community perspective, so that I know it's intensely difficult, uh, but it would be really good to know that we have a an evidence base or a compelling business case, which sounds dreadful, I know, but that's the only way to get some governments and others to part, play in this, in this space, to say, actually, this works, it makes economic sense, cultural, political and social sense. So any views on that? I want to bring in Zainab. Zainab, Sidan? Are you there? Yeah, hello. 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 Yeah, 
Uh, thank you so much for being here. Only I have one question because, like, I I've been working with refugees in risk settlements. Whereabouts are you, Zainab? Just to say, uh, I'm from you... Egypt. I'm yeah. from Egypt. Okay. Yes, but I have a question because yeah. I've, I've worked with refugees in resettlement units at the UNHCR here in Egypt uh, inter as an interpreter. What I have seen just like their own views or the first thing when they hear about integration uh, is that they cannot divide between integration and assimilation. Um, so when the first thing uh, they they are asked about what what how you react or how how can you put your kids, for example, to understand how society or or, or or how a new society think um, differently than the one they grow up. And most of the parents, for example, are illiterate or have no idea about different cultures or diverse cultures or how their kids, for example, can grow up in a different society. So what they ask all the time or they worry that is that is that going to affect our local cultures or our beliefs that we grow up or, for example, our religion. So what they say is that only we will send our kids to language classes and work integration, for example, to understand how society operates. Otherwise, that we cannot accept that our kids, for example, get in touch with, with different beliefs that would affect what they have grown up. So is there any mechanism, as mentioned from other speakers now, they, they are trying to work on citizens and communities of the receiving society. Is there any possibility that can be, for example, a pre-departure uh, orientation session, for example, for, for these parents or for these families who are about to be resettled in different countries, just to give them a clear vision of what integration is or what society is? Are going to immigrate no, sure, or... and you make a very good point, Zanab. Is that, and I, I, and and it's not a, it's a, not a new point either. It's been, it's been ever thus. I mean, uh, as someone who, who came to the UK uh, as a child uh, um, and from from Africa, and I know that many other communities that I was, you know, part of, there was this sense that. Um, Assimilation and integration were felt like dirty words. I felt you feel as if you're having to give up your identity in order to fit in. And that narrative hasn't changed a lot, especially when we know that at least uh, it continues that populist politicians and others will still talk about a national identity that's very, very exclusive of others. But let's see what some of our other people say. Driss, thank you very much for your comment. Driss Chukri, your video's off. Driss, are you there? You're on mute. Hello. Hi, okay. Hi, okay. do introduce yourself. Where are you, Driss? I am Driss Shukri from Mazagan Institute from Morocco, uh -huh. uh, Mazagan Institute for International Studies, and I am uh, an international consultant in research, uh, especially or specifically, I am doing focus groups all over the MENA region. Uh -huh. So, you know, like I have listened to uh, many of the speakers and uh, this is very interesting, uh, the ideas that they are coming uh, with, but I would like to shed light on something, you know, like is, is the difference between, you know, like the cities in the other side of the world uh -huh. and the cities in, in, in our side, in, in the MENA region. They have a different structure, hmm. a different, you know, like uh, composition. It's not the same. So. What applies in the in Europe, for example, not necessarily will 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 be applied here in in the region where we are. So, uh, I I would I, I would I, I would uh, join Eleonora for what she said in research because this is the main thing we need to do in order to uh, find cohesion and inclusion in the cities, uh, as as we are talking about here. So. You know, like uh, first of all, it it, it need be. We, we don't need to talk about the the, 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 the political decision. Is there a political decision first in order to imply or to 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 to, to, to bring this inclusion into the cities? Mm -hmm. Are the people who are taking decision aware of the importance of this uh, cohesion in the cities for the development and for the well-being of the people? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting first, and then. We need to do as much research as possible in order to understand exactly how uh, the, the, the host communities uh, are, 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 are perceiving the, 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 immigra the, the immigrants and how the immigrants are perceiving the local communities or the hosting communities. And then all of these things need to be done in order to, and, uh, you know, like at least to put a finger 
on where we need to do the, the action, the next action. So okay. I'm speaking here from, from a research perspective, uh -huh. but I am, you know, like uh, really sure that this is one of the ways in which we can get into what we are looking for. And I'm, I'm thank you for... Uh, no, thank you for your contribution and bringing in that fresh insight, which is very, very helpful. Uh, much, much appreciated. And obviously the, the, the point is that actually uh, on either side of the shore, the issue of culture, uh, history and politics plays its part in terms of this particular agenda. We cannot assume it's going to be one and the same thing. But thank you, thank you for your comment and your and your, and your notion. I want to go back to our panel for a moment, and as I know that Wallace, you've been wa waiting patiently uh, to come in, and I want to bring you in, Wallace. Welcome to this debate. So, Wallace, from your perspective, um, what? is the role of cities in promoting um, social con uh, inclusion, but um, how can this be supported by cohesion policy funds? Okay, good morning to all participants to this uh, seminar. I would like, first of all, to start by thanking Friends of Europe for the invitation today. And I would add on a personal note that it's a real pleasure to cooperate with the Annaline Foundation as I had the honor of working with Anna in the past. And as commission representative, of course, I particularly welcome the opportunity to have this dialogue with fellow esteemed panelists and audience about the benefits of intercultural integration at the local level. Well, as you may know, cohesion policy, the European Union cohesion policy, remains our foremost investment framework to support regional and local authorities to establish sustainable development strategies adapted to their needs, including with regards to social inclusion at the local level, urban and or territorial. At that point, I would like to remind you that actually sustainability goes hand in hand with resilience and plays a fundamental role in reducing disparities and providing actual access to equal opportunities and non-discrimination. All of you in the audience, I guess, have heard about the Sustainable Development Goals of the uh, United Nations 2030 uh, Agenda for Development. Now, at the European Union level, under the overarching objective of sustainable urban development and urban aid marking of 5% of the European Regional Development Fund in the current programming period, we actually, with this same European Regional Development Fund, ERDF, provide support for investment in several areas of social cohesion in cities, addressing in particular inequalities and fostering inclusion at the local level, including the long-term integration of people with a migrant background, the long-term integration of people with disabilities through deinstitutionalization and community-based services, and the integration of marginalized communities. When it comes to sustainable urban development, cohesion funds are also, or I should perhaps say notably, available in the scope in particular of the regeneration of deprived urban areas. Although this may not directly affect incomes, action on this front can substantially improve access to services, to employment, to schooling and education, to housing, while improving safety and integration without uh, further segregation. Mm -hmm. And these actions, we are also trying to mitigate the negative impacts of gentrification. So, Integrated measures in this respect, uh, when it comes to the regeneration of deprived neighborhoods, can also include actions to improve public spaces and green infrastructure to promote mixed neighborhoods or to improve accessibility of jobs and services available in other parts of the city or surrounding territory. And with the support of cohesion policies, our European cities can also facilitate the construction of more affordable housing to reduce housing costs and crowding, and thus also contributing to a lower level of urban poverty. Mm -hmm. Indeed, high housing costs may contribute to more people living in informal housing or even in the streets. Sure. 
So member states have also, our member states have also allocated um, the European Regional Development Fund support in education mm -hmm. to support schools together with kindergarten, crash and other educational facilities. And in the current programming period, this supports for educational facilities amount to not less than uh, 7 billion uh, euros of ERDF investment. And definitely, as one of the speakers said, it, inclusive education is our priority, in particular addressing the needs of vulnerable groups, such as Roma, people with disabilities, children, people with a migrant background, and so forth. Okay. And we have learned a lot, of course, through mm -hmm. our ex uh, recent experience in the past years. And we consider that for the next round of cohesion policy to come, 21-27, we should reinforce measures tackling educational and spatial segregation as part of our sustainable urban development strategies. That's and good to know. Have... Sorry? That's very good to know. I, I, I need you to conclude. But I think, I think that's a very yeah. good point to conclude on in terms of the yeah. fact that you're looking at this issue of education and segregation as a part of the new frontier of funding. I think that's going to be really effective both for communities on the ground, but the education systems and, and others. I want to bring in a couple of people who have been very, very uh, patient because we've only got five minutes or so left. But thank you, Wallace, for that, because I know that you had to step in at short notice uh, for the the panelist that was due to be here. So thank you for provi providing that information. Uh, and it's very helpful. But can I also say to all those of you, as we've only got five minutes left or so, and I should have men mentioned this earlier, use the Zoom chat to actually note your questions and issues. And we'll make sure that if there's a question that hasn't been answered, we'll try and make sure that the speakers uh, are able to respond to you directly on the Zoom chat. So um, as we run out, please do log your questions on the Zoom chat so that we can record it, but it's also there for posterity so we can make use of it for our report. I want to go to Asim. Asim Gweri. Hello. Mm. Hello. Good to having me. My name is Asim Gouwery. I am from Jordan, and I'm participating in Young Mediterranean Voices. Ah. And previously, I was work with Young Arab Voices. Okay. I would like to give a simple comment about the role in the city diversity. It's all about the autonomy for me. For example, schools, municipalities, hospitals. Can schools have the ability to decide which curriculum which suit them, especially in the intercultural level? This is number one. Number two, can the, the schools hire teachers which have the profession to identify the cultural community's identity clearly? This is number two. Number three, about the municipality. Municipality, unfortunately, it's always, always provide services but not in a justifying and equal level, mm -hmm. which makes a lot, makes a lot of challenges for those who are working in municipalities. For example, if there is a refugee in your city or in your town or in your own county, there is no level of political participation. Mm -hmm. Let's say if you would like to vote for the municipality to provide your services in the election, it gives you more power, more autonomy in your local communities and makes people more attention to you. This is number three. Number four, it's about the healthcare. Mm. Every hospital, in my perspective, should have a community inside it dedicated to help its people, which is living around it. I know that the healthcare providing should be without any discrimination but unfortunately, if citizens did not have the chance, neither the, the refugee to have the more access, especially in my country, Jordan, it makes a lot of a pressure for those kinds of efforts. So I will support to give more autonomy to schools, to municipalities, hospitals, to get the, okay. the ability to identify themselves clearly and to, to highlight the divine of the cultural perspective inside each town or city. Okay, Asim, that's a very interesting point of view. I understand uh, where you're coming from, but we know within communities also there are differences. And what we know is that discrimination uh, is um, endemic in society. So our institutions reflect that discrimination in different ways. So there isn't an institution that's not 
uh, if you like, uh, with some prejudice, uh, with a systemic racism or inequality in it because uh, they reflect society more broadly. But the question for you will be actually, what would happen if you did have that greater autonomy? Would it necessarily help the promotion of shared values, norms and behaviours um, or not, which is controversial. And you can see what was the comments made by Macron uh, last week uh, in the context of uh, the uh, awful situation uh, we find ourselves in with regard to the teacher and, and the spewing out of some deep, deep, deep uh, cultural uh, divisions uh, and um, sense of sense of community and what national identity, identity is about. So it will be interesting to get other people's views on that point. It's coming. It's now eleven, and we really. I will, I'll just spend a couple of more minutes with you, if I may, um, if I can crave your indulgence, as they say in the legal profession. Um, if I can crave your indulgence for another couple of minutes, that will be helpful. Because I want to turn to Burak. Burak, you're on mute. Hi. Hello. Very warm welcome. Do I know you? Obviously, you are a regular uh, a friend of the house. But introduce yourself to others on the Zoom audience. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Germany, and I'm an alumni of the Young Mediterranean Voices program. Um, I want to say a few facts uh, for Germany um, regarding the Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann Foundation report last year. It said that Germany needs 260,000 new uh, workforce for to bridge the gap in the in the labor market, and if you consider this this dimension, we can see that there will there will be a huge migration to cities. And I want to ask, um, how how can we deal with the migrants in the in, in the periphery of the cities to integrate them in the local decision making, to solve the local problems? I think in the in the chat box there was a there was a link for uh, having experts in, in advisory councils. Uh, of the cities, but are there concrete examples of uh, solving local problems, especially in capital cities like Paris, Berlin, London, um, of radicalization, of, of marginalization, and how are these migrants used to um, solve the problem in a different way, which would be less costly for, um, for the uh, local decision makers? Uh, Burak, from your point of view, what have you um, uh, have you seen this happen successfully? Um, and how I should it happen? How should it happen? Well, I think I think it's happening uh, on a rolling basis on big cities, but it's not really uh, in a way where you solve problems because mm. many times migrants are seen as the source of the problem, but not as the source of the solution. So it's, it takes a long time to integrate in the integrate them in the decision making because they are um, ex excluded and they have to fight and work more to get into these positions. So there is a structural issue in, I, I, especially also in cities, that these people have to do more to be accepted, recognized and be included. So sure. um, I speak of Paris, for example, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, uh, they, 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 there is a need for an intra-city dialogue among the banlieues and the, uh, and the city itself because this would solve many problems and it would give a chance for especially young people in these uh, in the outskirts and the peripheries to be listened and to be seen as French citizens or to be seen as Absolutely. part of the solution. Absolutely. Which, uh, prevent many problems, yeah. especially the horrific incident uh, uh, last week in France. Yeah, I think it would be a good measure to tackle this problem from the from the from the ground. I mean, from Completely the... agree with you, Barack. Because I, and I also don't think that's uh, specific to this issue. I think there's a governance issue uh, crisis across Europe and w wider in terms of how communities and citizens actually are engaged in problem solving and co-producing solutions. And I think one of the one of my experience, if I share it as someone who's worked in race relations in the UK uh, and was head of the Commission for Racial Equality for some time, one of my absolute frustrations uh, was the role of the community leader. I, o I often, I st even in when I reflect on it, I see it as being the easiest um, uh, way, laziest way in which actually people uh, were, were made into gatekeepers and were seen as the voice of a whole community because it was easy, 
um, it made made it made you uh, feel as if you'd done your job and felt that actually you had access when in fact actually what you didn't do was reach into the heart of communities and that concept of a community leader um, is um, quite ingrained and I don't think we've moved beyond it but it, it can be I think a, a very dangerous uh, approach because what you end up doing is you end up not listening and engaging with communities on the ground. Iman, Iman Al Karadi. Hello, warm welcome to you. Hello. Where are you? Hello. Hi, where are you? Uh, so I'm Iman uh, Al Yeah, here I am. <laughs> uh, so I'm Iman Al Karawi from Morocco. Are you in Morocco? Great. Uh, yes, yes. And I want to share with you um, this experience that we have here in Morocco. So for the past few years, uh, we've had a lot of um, sub-Saharan Africans uh, come into Morocco, and there's just been, um, how to call it, an en enormous amount of racism. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting, coming from, you know, a country that's been colonized, uh, a country who has felt Islamophobia. But still, there is a lot of racism, and I think a lot of it comes from, um, you know, there is no understanding. Uh, there is no... If effort to understand the two cultures uh, while there is actually a lot of similarities um, between um, you know the cultures and uh, but I feel like it's changing so that's a good thing mm -hmm. uh, again for the past few years uh, we've had uh, students come into sub-saharan students come into Moroccan universities and you know as you know um, schools and uh, universities are different from people you just see in the streets. So yes. if you have sub-Saharan African in your school, you need to talk to them, you need to interact. Uh, you, then, you, you come to understand that we're all similar at the end. And I feel like it's just very sad that there is no effort uh, to understand each other, to communicate with each other from both, both parties, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so... I feel like that's the, the biggest problem here in Morocco. And I feel like a lot of people, again, both parties feel like it's all just temporary, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, so they're just going to come back to their country or maybe they're just going to, you know, go to Europe. But I feel like this is really not something that's not going to happen. Uh, we will have to eventually, uh, you know, leave with each other and connect with each other and understand each other. Um, Iman, before you go, if, if I can, yes. do you feel things are changing for your generation? Do you think that the internet and um, the kind of cultural habits you form in, in through the internet and elsewhere in the connections you make is changing that dynamic? Because I'm, I'm so pleased that you brought in that, 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 that freshness of, 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 of approach that actually it's everywhere. And, um, you know, identity politics is one of the biggest issues for us in the globe and we pay very little attention to it and do not understand its economic, social and political value in terms of creating stability uh, across the world. But do you feel that it's changing for your generation? Absolutely, absolutely. I think Americanization, McDonaldization, all those things uh, can be seen as bad. But in terms of, you know, understanding each other, uh, I think it has changed a lot. Uh, the way I see you know, sub-Saharan Africans is not the same way my parents see them. Indeed. For me, just see them as other people. We're all the same. And, you know, media has also changed the way we perceive each other. Again, you know, very important point. I think there's been, been a lot of media inclusion for uh, uh, African Americans, uh, a lot of media inclusion for uh, Latinas, but we for Arabs and Muslims, we're, we're still waiting for this, um, you know, uh, media, you know, for, for us to stop being terrorists and become something more than that. Indeed. So, uh, in the end, uh, I think, yeah. So, yeah, TV has helped a lot. No, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Because I, I, that was my sense, but I wanted to hear it from you because I, I get a sense that, you know, when we think about um, our consumption, of what happens in the world and in our in our locality it is so global and we you know there are these shattering moments of black lives matters or the hashtag me too campaigns etc uh, which shift the dial just a little bit on, on how we perceive each other and suddenly we have a wake-up call that we need to interact differently but your generation i feel um, um has 
a very different sense because of, as, you've, as you referred to, that you know, when you look at uh, the different cultural anchors and institutions that your, your generation will revolve around, have a very different habit of how you see others. And I think that we need to have that sense better. Colleagues, I'm going to run out, I'm run out of time, um, dramatically so. It's nearly 10 past, just uh, 10 past 11. So I'm so sorry. I want to thank all our contributors. Um, I want you to, con you know, if you can, continue the chat. We, uh, um, and um, you know, Friends of Europe and Anna Lind Foundation, will continue this discussion, this debate. It's not going to go away. It's ingrained. It's, uh, it's at the, I suppose it's part of the DNA of how society works, and we mustn't lose sight of that. And we need to move beyond the original sin, uh, as, we, as Elena, you mentioned, that at some point we need to learn the lessons of not uh, viewing our policy development in this space through received wisdom. We need to break the mould of actually understanding that in the modern world that we live in, that um, diversity matters, inclusion matters, and identity politics are really going to be much more important in the future. When you think about uh, migratory uh, patterns over the next 20 years, when we look at the role of urbanisation, um, um, uh, over the world, and especially in Europe and um, um, Africa, this subject isn't going to go away. It's only going to become much more um, either heated, if we don't do something about it, or actually we can learn from those mistakes, and hopefully policymakers, politicians, will do the right thing. Let's hope. Uh, but what I do know from experience, and you know this from experience actually, that and we and it was good to have uh, Iman say what she said. There's a generation growing up, especially behind us, as people of my age uh, and those in their 40s and 30s. There's a generation growing up that's seeing the world very differently. And I'm hope my hope is that you know uh, that we don't have to leave it to them to change their circumstances. That we will also do the right thing. Thank you all very much for your time, your energy, commitment, and I'm sorry that we've not taken all your answers but I hope that you can use the chat. We're going to leave the chat on to share your ideas. And as I said, we will come back to you and scoop some of this up. And if you're interested, those of you who are online, if you want to have an engaged debate around this topic um, uh, more so, get in touch. Get in touch with us and the Allen Foundation and we'll see what we can do in the new year. Because I think this issue of identity and identity politics as I said, it's not going to go away. I think it's going to become deeper and sharper and become a new fault line, uh, um, a tw modern 21st century fault line for how we live our lives in the future. Thank you all very much uh, for participating, both on Zoom and live stream. You are the reason why these things happen, so thank you very much. Um, be safe, mind your distance, and take care, and see you again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>